When someone you love enters the LGBTQ world, you might suddenly feel like what Rosari Butterfield calls an accidental missionary. You can't lose a minute feeling sorry for yourself. Yes, you're an accidental missionary. You're on this new mission field. You don't have the language. They didn't even give you a bottle of water. But you have the Lord Jesus Christ. You have your church. You have your praying sisters. Use all of those. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgermuth, co-author of True Woman 101 and 201. For June 26, 2023, I'm Dana Gresh. I think it can be disconcerting for followers of Jesus when the world wants to redefine all the terms. I mean, up becomes down, right becomes wrong. Definitions of words that used to be simple, like man and woman, are hotly contested. And I I think sometimes it's easy for us to think, what in the world is going on? Have we lost our minds? So true, Dana. But I said this last week, and I'm going to say it again. Actually, the author of Ecclesiastes said it first. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, language is constantly changing, and words do develop new meanings. But the core attitudes and thought patterns behind what we're seeing today go all the way back to the Garden of Eden. It may feel like we're in crazy, new, uncharted waters, but we're really seeing the same old lies dressed up in new clothes. That's one reason it's so helpful to hear thoughtful analysis and clear, biblically-based thinking from wise, godly leaders. I know it helps me put into words what can be really difficult to express. Well, our guest speaker today is a brilliant thinker and communicator. Her name is Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. She's going to make us think, and if that sounds a little intimidating, don't worry. I love the way Rosaria goes beyond the theoretical and helps us apply things to our lives in a really practical way. Rosaria spent a number of years in a university setting, defending and teaching values that were diametrically opposed to the Word of God, values related to gender and sexuality. Then God got hold of her life, and gradually, everything in her world was turned upside down. Well, actually, right side up. Rosari is now married to a pastor, and she's the mother of four children. She joined us via a video call for a workshop on gender and sexuality at the recent True Woman Conference. During that workshop, the speakers looked at various aspects of an important passage in Romans chapter 1. You'll hear that referenced today. Now let's listen to Rosaria Butterfield. It is really an honor to be here with you today. And this is a tough topic. And sometimes clarity is a hard thing because it has some hard edges. But my topic today is when a loved one has rejected God's plan for sexuality and gender. So I want to frame my talk today with a couple of kind of, I want to hit a few points. And the first one is I want to start out with just an honest, clarifying reaction about how we got to where we are and where exactly are we. We are now in a culture that has codified or written into law the three exchanges that you see in Romans 1. And that means that we need to think about what's going on differently than we did even five years ago. For, I know for some people, you know, we we're wondering, is the world really different or are we just getting older? Well, both, both. So in Romans 1, at the end of Romans 1, we see three exchanges. And even the word, of, the word exchange is even in the actual language. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened, claiming to be wise they became fools and exchanged. Okay, what are the three exchanges? The first one is the truth of God for the lies of the world. The second one is the worship of the creator. We exchange the worship of the creator for the worship of creation. And specifically, we exchange the worship of God for the worship of man. And then the third exchange, which we see at the very end, is an exchange of natural sexuality, which is 
a fruitful sexuality for a debased and barren sexuality. So we have moved from heterosexuality to homosexuality. Now, how do they become codified into law? Well, two words, Obergefell and Boztok. Obergefell versus Hodges was the 2015 Supreme Court case that legalized gay marriage in all 50 states. And the Boztok case, it came up around during COVID. So sometimes people haven't really paid as close attention to it as we ought. That is the case that actually established LGBTQ as a civil rights problem. So when I lived as a lesbian, I would have said that you harmed me if I went to buy a pizza and you didn't sell me a pizza because I was gay. And that was very bad. And it would be very material. You know, I didn't get my pizza. But today there's a totally different ethos around harm. And it's because of a particular clause that was inserted into the Obergefell case. It's called the Dignitary Harm Clause. And that clause basically says that hurting someone's dignity is a form of discriminating against their civil rights. And so if you've wondered why all of a sudden all the stickers and the pronouns and the flags, and why does everybody have to agree with that? Well, that's the Dignitary Harm clause at work. Carl Truman in his new book does a wonderful job of explaining this in terms of expressive individualism. So your feelings are not just feelings. They're an extension of yourself. They're like an arm or a leg. And when people don't affirm them, it's almost like they chopped off your arm or they chopped off your leg. And so it's a very strange world that we're in, but here is where we are. And so the question is, how do we move forward? And I want to introduce a couple of principles. The first is knowing the difference between acceptance and approval. And the second is knowing the difference between private and public. So acceptance means living in reality and not in fantasy. If your daughter calls herself a lesbian, I think it's really important to just accept that. That is reality for her, and you need to accept it. In fact, it's the first step in seeing the person that you love in the sin pattern in which she is trapped. But acceptance does not include believing her interpretation of how she got here, or even what it means. Acceptance does not include believing that your son named Rex is really your daughter named Matilda. Acceptance does not include being manipulated by the therapist who says, if you don't call you know, him or her by the new pronouns, you are a cause of suicide. Acceptance rejects that because acceptance does not lose sight of Jesus, even as it works with the current situation as it, as it appears to be. Now, approval is very different. Approval means you give the whole situation a blessing. Approval means more than loving your daughter in her sin. It means calling her sin by another name. Maybe you call it grace. Maybe you call it blessing. Maybe you call it illness, but it tends to compartmentalize your Christian life. Approval means denying Christ. That means denying hope and denying your responsibility to carry the cross that your age and your status require. It means getting Luke 14, 26, 27 wrong. That's that hard parable where Jesus talks about hating your mother and your father. Of course, hate in that context means love less, but it is very important if you are loving your prodigal, that you love your prodigal less than you love Jesus. For a Christian to approve of sin is itself a sin, and you will not be able to help the person you love if you are stuck in this place. And, and this place is simply this, you, you, you want to be able to stay connected to your prodigal without becoming indoctrinated by the mass hysteria around her and around you. So 
I would say that acceptance and approval is the fine line that a Christian who loves someone trapped by these lies must navigate. Now, I learned that acceptance is a great kindness, even without approval. And I learned this from Ken and Floyd Smith over you know decades ago, when they told me that they could accept me as a lesbian, but their acceptance did not mean approval. And this was 1997, and I really took no offense to that. Um, there are other things to be offended by. The gospel was actually profoundly more offensive than, than Ken and, and Floyd saying this. I actually appreciated the honesty behind these words. And while acceptance is not approval, it's actually a great kindness. Acceptance means dealing protectively and gently with the person who is lost. And I learned from the Smiths that acceptance involves listening, caring for, praying with, and sharing God's word over and over again. Now, in today's culture, one of the real challenges that today's culture poses, presses on this acceptance approval difference, is that back in 1997, there was no social media. I was not sitting down with a pastor who was going to potentially, you know, do a Twitter rant about what we just talked about. That, that wasn't even possible. And that's because that culture knew that private was private and public was public. And I would like to encourage women that we embrace that. Exhibitionism has replaced modesty to our great harm and detriment. So to have a good relationship with your prodigal or just anyone who is lost and that you want to witness to, you may want to take a very, very good look at your social media. You want to make sure people do not become gratuitously offended or hurt by that. Sin tends to make more work for all of us, but sin also breeds paranoia. So don't give your prodigal reasons to run and don't take responsibility for your prodigal's decision if she does run. That's on her. You are a praying parent or grandparent and you're praying for a lost child, but you're also praying for a prayed for child. And a prayed for child truly makes all the difference in the world. So I wanna think about how we can apply this to just some of the questions that come into my website pretty regularly. And here are some of the big, just the big strokes from my website, I'd say in the last two months or so. The first is this, parents, please do not think that just because your prodigal is an adult, that you are no longer parenting. You will be parenting your adult child until the day the Lord takes you home. You must become adept at pointing your adult child to the gospel as the only means of avoiding God's ultimate judgment. Number two, if your prodigal has declared war against reality and believes that she is non-binary or with that a whole host of other words, ask her to define these new words. Your daughter is now living in a dystopic world of science fiction. You never wanted to write this story anyway, so put the burden on her to explain. You don't need to get a PhD in all of this new vocabulary. You actually get to be sanctified in your ignorance. Number three, no biblical doctrine better than you have ever known it before. Use biblical doctrine as a filter way to interpret some of these new words that you're learning. That means be fully immersed in the Bible, but have a way of interpreting, of, of shaping and framing. Know how to interpret the minor passages according to the major passages. And the way you would do that is to just pick up a good book in systematic theology. My favorite is the Westminster Confession of Faith. You may have other ones. And make sure that you are in a faithful biblical church. And if you're not, get to one fast. And take the covenant of church membership. Even though it may mean breaking friendships with your former church, you need to get to a faithful church for the sake of your own soul, but also for the power of your 
witness. Of course, you know you need to pray and you need to get all of your friends to pray as well. This is no time to be embarrassed. That's what Satan wants you to be. You, you have no reason to be ashamed. You need to pray. Then you need to go boldly to the throne of grace. We need daily repentance of our own sin so that we can, in fact, throw someone over our shoulders and share the gospel in a, in a useful way. So we need to repent of the sin of self-pity. Satan wants you to feel responsible that you have a prodigal child. He wants you to think this is all your fault and that God is punishing you. Satan wants you to look at other families and covet what they have. And nothing that comes from Satan is helpful or true. And even half-truths are really just lies. So if you've fallen into the sin of covetousness, coveting somebody else's perfect family, repent and ask God to help you love your child more than you do now. You know, I talk to parents who tell me that they feel like an accidental missionary. They have a child who's gone prodigal and entered into this strange LGBTQ world. And it's a it is a strange world. And I, I will always feel something. I think res responsible. I'm not sure what the word is, but the blood is on my hands. I, I wasn't just the lesbian next door. I was an activist. I co-authored the first university's policy for gay marriage. I, I helped build this machine. You don't need to feel responsible. I, could, I can and should, but you don't need to. But you can't lose a minute feeling sorry for yourself. Yes, you're an accidental missionary. You're on this new mission field. You don't have the language. They didn't even give you a bottle of water, but you have the Lord Jesus Christ. You have your church. You have your praying sisters. Use all of those. And finally, and this is a hard one, acceptance, accepting your prodigal means not telling her lies and not buying into her false theology. I know that that might mean a time of physical separation, but it does not, does not matter how physically separated you are from your prodigal. You are never separated from the love of God or the throne of grace where you can flee there in an instant and pray for her. God knows and loves your child better than you do. And that is a very big comfort. And what all of this really comes down to is Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. A snare is an instrument of execution from which you cannot extricate yourself. But fearing God is safe. It's a refuge. It's a shield. It's very tempting, very, very tempting to fear your prodigal and to get a little bit bullied into the idea that if you don't concede some of these Christian ideas that you are going to push her further away. And that is not true. It's a good question though. I mean, how many of us, how many times have we abandoned our duties because we thought success could only come through disobedience? We need to remember God's promises and how he cares for us when we follow them. We cannot fear our prodigals and be any good to them in the process. You know, we live in a world now where LGBTQ is really the idol of our day. And like it or not, we are standing against that idol. And people who don't worship the idol of the day are, are despised. But your prodigal's insistence that LGBTQ is his life's center reveals this idolatry. It reveals that homosexuality or transgenderism or any of the other signifiers of the alphabet soup, that's really his religion. 
And that's why he's so touchy about you getting all the vocabulary right. There is a difference between worship and recognition, and you do not need to take the bait. Your focus is on loving your prodigal well and praying. And so I leave you with a final thought that might be a hard one. We are not living in days of peace. People are getting fired for their jobs from not using preferred pronouns. It seems like the whole university system is standing against us. Certainly, we can see that the government school system is. The temptation is to believe that somehow, if we would just compromise, that it will go easier for us. And it will not. In fact, part of how we got here is we probably all made all kinds of concessions and compromises over the last couple of decades that we ought not. And so the good news is today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. And I will be praying that today is the day of salvation for the prodigal that you have on your heart. But today is also the day that we are called to take hold of that plow and not let go. And so my prayer for you, dear sister, is that you will persevere, that you will persevere in godliness and persevere in joy. And I thank God for you. I thank God that you are at this conference. And I pray God's every blessing upon you. Thank you. Wow, what an encouraging and helpful message from Rosaria Butterfield given last fall at a pre-conference workshop at True Woman 22. Rosaria is the author of several excellent books, including The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, where she tells her own conversion story, and The Gospel Comes with a House Key, which is all about the ministry of hospitality. You'll find both of those books in my own personal library, or you could get a copy for your library. Just follow the link in the transcript of today's program at reviveourhearts.com or on the Revive Our Hearts app. And stay tuned for her new book coming out in September. I can't wait. It's titled Five Lies of Our Anti-Christian Age. And Nancy, you were right. Rosari's message was so helpful in showing us the truth of what God's Word says. But I would say it's also practical to give us specific ways that we can apply that truth to our lives. Yeah, so good, Dana. I love Rosaria's heart. And perhaps someone you love, maybe a son or a daughter, a grandchild— a sibling, a parent, someone who has rejected God's design for gender and sexuality. They've strayed from God's Word, and maybe they're living in great confusion and pain. Well, I hope you found real encouragement and comfort in Rosaria's message today. Don't stop praying. And keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. And keep persevering in godliness and in joy, as Rosaria just mentioned. Yep. And again, you'll find more information on our books in the transcript of this program at reviveourhearts.com. And while you're there, be sure to read about Julie Slattery's book, Rethinking Sexuality. That book is our thank you gift to you for your donation of any amount this month. Request your copy with your donation at reviveourhearts.com or when you call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. 5959. And can I just thank you so much for your support? And let me add my thanks to you as well. The prayers you lift up and the gifts you give are doing more than you could ever imagine. It's so exciting to hear reports from around the world on how the message of freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ is making an impact. In fact, let's just take a quick tour right now. Here's a clip from our German Seeking Him podcast. Nicht unbedingt. Natürlich will man nicht nur gefühlsgesteuert agieren, aber es spricht vieles für das Beibehalten guter Gewohnheiten, auch wenn unsere Gefühle nicht immer mitgehen. And this is Revive Our Hearts in French. Chaque femme, qu'elle soit riche ou pauvre, mariée ou célibataire, possède un réseau d'influence. Donc il parle de vous, hein? vous avez un cercle d'influence. And Portuguese. O mesmo acontece em nossa relação com Deus. Como Charles Spurgeon diz, devemos orar quando sentimos vontade de orar. 
Here's Farsi, the Persian language. بعد اینکه خدا در ارتباط با اومدن یک نجات دهنده میده. نجات دهنده ای که در آغاز برخلاف انتظار هر کس مثل یک پادشاه قدرتمند ظاهر نخواهد شد. And check this one out. Vietnamese. In fact, I had a chance to share a clip like this with my Vietnamese nail tech recently and you should have seen her face light up. Bạn đã cảm thấy yêu mến thi thiên 110 chưa khi chúng ta bắt đầu ngày thứ ba trong cả loạt bài? Hay bạn vẫn còn cảm thấy có chút bối rối? We're partnering with our friends at Far East Broadcasting Company, FEBC, to broadcast Revive Our Hearts content into some hard-to-reach places like Vietnam and China. Here's my point. Millions of women around the world are hearing about freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ because of your prayers and your giving. That's huge. I can't thank you enough. Oh, that is so exciting. I love hearing stuff like that. Again, you can contact us with your donation at reviveourhearts.com through the Revive Our Hearts app or by calling 1-800-569-5959. Tomorrow, we're making another visit to that same True Woman 22 pre-conference session on gender and sexuality. We'll hear once again from Dr. Julie Slattery. She'll expand on a concept we've heard her talk about before, that of sexual discipleship. She'll explain what she means by that term and how you and I can be a part of promoting sexual integrity. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, inviting you into true freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.